Roosevelt was frustrated with complacent attitudes and selfish interests at home while soldiers sacrificed abroad. He decided to reassert American liberalism and declare war on these domestic elements in his 1944 State of the Union speech. First, he confusingly told the press not to use New Deal anymore, saying the patient, America, was now cured and needed a new doctor, Dr. Winderwar, to treat its new injuries from the war smash-up. Two weeks later, Roosevelt gave the most radical speech of his presidency. He lashed out at unseeing moles, pests, and selfish pressure groups, undermining the war effort through strikes, business as usual, and whining demands. He asked Congress for stabilization policies to control inflation and corporate profits. Then came the climax, a second Bill of Rights that would guarantee economic security through government action, the right to a job, adequate food and housing, health care, and education. Roosevelt argued that individual freedom depends on economic security. This was the culmination of decades of liberal thought, linking political rights to economic rights achieved through government. But Congress responded with a thud. Old barons like Wheeler still held sway and now could block Roosevelt's main goal, leading the country into an effective post-war security organization. Haunted by Wilson's defeat, Roosevelt proceeded cautiously on post-war planning. He led homemade plans but refused to take the lead even on a mild congressional resolution supporting post-war international machinery. He worried about echoing the League of Nations controversy. Roosevelt wanted post-war planning to be gradual and completely bipartisan. But many senators wanted more specifics. When the Senate Foreign Relations Committee reported out the Connolly resolution favoring U.S. participation in maintaining post-war peace, Roosevelt still saw it as too specific. He wanted the language as general as possible to avoid another league-like debate. The history-minded president was determined to learn from Wilson's mistakes and avoid letting post-war organizations get bogged down in details, but many senators felt the specifics were what mattered most. Once again, Roosevelt faced potential obstruction from Congress. In early 1944, President Roosevelt faced challenges from Congress on several fronts. The issue of the servicemen's vote in the election exposed political tensions and campaign sensitivities. Roosevelt demanded that Congress pass a bill allowing all servicemen to vote absentee in federal elections. But many in Congress saw this as an attempt to line up soldiers for a potential fourth term. Senator Taft accused Roosevelt of planning to use soldiers as he once used WPA workers. Southern lawmakers feared the bill would override poll taxes and enable black soldiers to vote. There were ugly attacks on the bill from figures like John Rankin. After weeks of debate, the bill that passed was watered down and limited in scope. Only 85,000 soldiers were able to vote using the federal ballot in the 1944 election. Roosevelt also faced resistance on tax legislation. He asked Congress for $10.5 billion in new revenues, but the bills that passed would raise only around $2 billion. The president vetoed the tax bill, calling it a tax relief bill providing relief not for the needy, but for the greedy. He condemned Congress for favoring special interests. Senate Majority Leader Alban Barkley was furious at Roosevelt's harsh veto message. He denounced the message from the Senate floor and resigned as majority leader in protest. However, Roosevelt appeared unconcerned. He drafted a conciliatory letter to Barclay urging him not to resign. Behind the scenes, Senate Democrats immediately re-elected Barclay as majority leader. Though Congress overrode Roosevelt's veto, the episode left bitterness. It highlighted the gap between the White House and Congress. Roosevelt also failed to pass a national service bill that Stinson supported. Congress was not willing to unite labor and business under such a bill. Though Roosevelt met weekly with congressional leaders, he could not overcome opposition on key issues. Congress was sensitive to economic pressures while Roosevelt saw a moral purpose in the legislation. In summary, early 1944 saw Roosevelt facing resistance from Congress on multiple fronts. The servicemen's vote issue exposed political tensions. The tax bill veto angered lawmakers, but Roosevelt appeared unconcerned by the fallout. Roosevelt's failure to unite Congress showed the limits of his influence. While he met with leaders regularly, Congress prioritized economic interests over Roosevelt's moral arguments on issues like national service. 
So we see the complex dynamics at play between the President and Congress. Roosevelt's ambitions were stymied by lawmakers sensitive to political and economic pressures, highlighting the challenges he faced in governing. Roosevelt assumed he would run for a fourth term only if the war was still ongoing in summer 1944. Many Americans expected the war to be over by then, but Roosevelt felt it would take much longer. In March 1944, he told visitors, we have got a long, long road to go. We are going to win the war, it is going to take an awfully long time. At that time, the Italy campaign was stalled. Despite inching north of Naples, the 5th and 8th armies were halted at the Gustav Rhine in rough, mountainous terrain favoring the defenders. Attempts to cross the Rapido River failed with heavy casualties. Churchill wanted to revive the stalled Italian offensive, insisting Mediterranean operations remained vital, criticizing American clear-cut, logical thinking. Churchill pleaded with Roosevelt to delay overlord landing craft headed to Britain to enable an amphibious landing at Anzio to break the Gustav Line deadlock. Despite concerns about delays to overlord and southern France invasion plans, Roosevelt conceded. The Anzio landings initially went well, but the invaders dug in rather than dashed to Rome when faced with Kesselring's reinforcements. The Gustav Line remained stalled below Casino. Churchill was dismayed by the failure to exploit Anzio, while Roosevelt faced British calls to scrap the southern France invasion and focus on Italy. Fearing Soviet reaction, Roosevelt refused to cancel the invasion without consulting Moscow. A compromise kept both Italy and southern France plans alive. As Overlord was postponed to end of May, the Italian campaign was building in strength and priority over French invasion plans. Roosevelt also faced doubts over unconditional surrender doctrine, as it was used by Nazi propaganda to claim the Allies sought to destroy Germany. The Joint Chiefs asked Roosevelt to clarify that the intention was to defeat German militarism, not the German people. But Roosevelt refused, stating that German philosophy could not be changed quickly, perhaps taking two generations. He was unwilling to say the Allies did not intend to destroy the German nation. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Morgenthau confronted Roosevelt over inaction to rescue Jews from Hitler. State Department officials were accused of hindering rescue efforts. Shocked by the accusations, Roosevelt established the War Refugee Board to take over rescue operations. Although late for many, the new board finally put urgency into saving those who could still be rescued. The Pacific strategy was also transformed following Cairo. Instead of perimeter defense and island hopping, planners now proposed massive amphibious assaults across the western Pacific to isolate and blockade Japan for final assault. This would allow major blows against Japan concurrent with the European war, meeting demands for greater Pacific effort. The new offensive opened with amphibious landings in the Marshall Islands in January. The islands provided air bases to bomb truck naval base in the Carolines. These offensives showed Pacific supply lines were now secure. MacArthur could accelerate his drive toward the Philippines while Nimitz could strike westward across the Central Pacific. But Roosevelt faced presidential election issues. Party leaders opposed a fourth term. Roosevelt gave mixed signals about his intentions. He claimed hands were tied on running until the war ended, but privately believed only he had the experience to win the peace. His health concerns seemed manageable as the election approached. With Roosevelt's intentions unclear, Democrats hesitated to oppose him openly, but quietly supported James Burns of South Carolina for nominee, considering him a good compromise candidate if Roosevelt stepped aside. Yet Burns faced doubts that he could defeat any Republican nominee. And if Roosevelt ran, Burns would step aside. Ultimately, Roosevelt realized that only his leadership could unite the party and the country behind the immense post-war tasks ahead. His role in founding the United Nations and shaping the peace convinced him he must stay on. When he saw the convention would nominate him, Roosevelt agreed to run again without hesitation. The delegates cheered his appearance on July 20, 1944 to accept the nomination for the fourth time. Roosevelt was still running the White House in 1944 much as he had before the war, even as huge new defense and welfare bureaucracies arose in Washington that would shape the capital for decades. The West Wing remained the apex, with old hands like Early and Watson serving Roosevelt, who disliked set communication channels, leading to spillover office space across the street. 
the east wing housed Burns and his small staff struggling to coordinate civilian agencies. Burns chaired a war mobilization committee, the closest thing to a war cabinet. In crowded offices, Admiral Lee Yi had few aides as personal chief of staff, running meetings of the joint chiefs of staff but recognizing key decisions happened directly between Roosevelt and individual members, especially Marshall. The Budget Bureau, under Smith, had moved far beyond budgets to coordinate and review the administration. On paper it looked orderly, the president on top, his assistant presidents below, then control radiating out. But Roosevelt followed his tendency for administrative chaos. He had at least a dozen assistant presidents, fuzzy lines of command, and problematic secrecy even within his administration. With Hopkins still recovering, Roosevelt seemed in no hurry to have him back as the one man who had truly served as chief of staff. Meanwhile, Roosevelt feuded with the press, though he struggled to muzzle far-right critics he considered seditious. His clash with Montgomery Ward Sewell Avery over unions and seizure of property made headlines too. There was also deep secrecy around the atomic bomb project, unknown even to some top officials like Hull. Exceptional security precautions created strains, including with Congress over appropriations and with the British over sharing information. But Roosevelt drove the intense secrecy, convinced it was crucial to beat the Germans. So while logically organized on paper, in reality Roosevelt sustained his tendency for administrative disorder and secrecy despite the huge new war machinery, relying on a myriad of assistant presidents in lieu of a master chief of staff. The atomic project in particular operated in intense secrecy even from those within his administration. As President Roosevelt drove through Washington, D.C., he saw a city transformed, government buildings expanding, sidewalks filled with soldiers and civilian workers. Factories across the nation were churning out planes, ships, and munitions at astonishing speed, over 100,000 planes a year, a feat many had claimed impossible. The whole economy was booming, income soaring, unemployment vanishing. The demand for labor seemed infinite. Over 60% of the population was employed, including teenagers and elderly. The war migration uprooted over 11 million young men and women, while millions more moved to cities and industrial areas for jobs. This massive migration, especially of blacks and whites from the South, was changing the face of America. Many families were separated, spending less time together. Traditional social hierarchies and distinctions were breaking down. With the draft, military service and factory work valued over other jobs. Young people gained new freedom and importance. But not all could share equally in this new society. Discrimination and racial tensions were rising. As blacks migrated north for better pay, they faced housing shortages and exclusion from many neighborhoods and jobs. Whites across the nation overwhelmingly felt blacks were inferior and deserved fewer chances. Some strikes and violence erupted over integration in factories and neighborhoods. Government agencies like the Fair Employment Practices Committee were too weak to address the systemic racism. Similarly, over 100,000 Japanese Americans remained in concentration camps, though the military saw no need for their detention. Despite promises to restore their rights, President Roosevelt proceeded cautiously, worried about white hostility on the West Coast. America's ideals of equality and opportunity seemed hollow to many minorities. The school systems also struggled to adapt. Public schools thrived with increased enrollment, while college campuses stood empty as students and teachers were drafted. The Army and Navy took over many colleges for training programs instead. Traditional liberal arts studies declined, replaced by military instruction and scientific research for the war effort. Clearly, World War II shook American society to its foundations. Out of the disruption emerged new opportunities for women, blacks and other groups. But discrimination and inequality also hardened in some quarters. The country was stretched between the war's demand for maximum unity and production and the rising calls from minorities for equal rights and treatment after the war. Much would depend on the leaders who emerged from the crisis to shape America's future. In the third year of World War II, America was fully engaged in the war effort, with citizens sacrificing on the home front and soldiers fighting on the battlefronts. Yet an ambivalence existed between the consensus President Roosevelt sought to build around the war 
and a lack of deeper understanding among the public about the war's meaning. While Americans strongly supported the war financially and materially, investing billions in war bonds and growing 20 million victory gardens, there was little evidence that people grasped the deeper significance of the conflict. Surveys showed they felt they were fighting for freedom and a democracy in the abstract, not out of any personal commitment. Few remember the Atlantic Charter or four freedoms that Roosevelt articulated as war aims. The people seemed focused on winning the war quickly so life could return to normal. Some blamed Roosevelt for failing to educate the public, but he insisted he had proclaimed the goals clearly in speeches. Observers recognized that the White House itself, with its formality and barriers, may have distanced him from the people. Yet Roosevelt seemed energetic in press conferences. He connected with old friends and traveled to stay in touch. Still, his manner changed when talks turned from the war itself to tricky domestic issues like strikes. The people's confidence remained fairly high, but seemed to rest more on his competence than ideals. Soldiers overseas showed a similar practical focus on defeating the enemy and coming home. Despite differences from civilian life, no deep gulf separated the two groups' outlooks. Soldiers knew little of the four freedoms and felt no personal stake, just a faith in the rightness of their cause and certainty they would win. Their commander-in-chief was simply the leader to get the job done. The GI had no consistent ideology, but embraced a new culture around the daily grind and grim routine of war, with its own humor, rituals, and makeshift comforts. Officers recognized the missing spirit for battle. Frank Capra made the Why We Fight films using newsreels to educate troops on the war's origins, but these had little impact on general attitudes. What motivated GIs was getting the war over with. Like civilians buoyed by Roosevelt after Pearl Harbor, soldiers were spurred by the bare fact of war. They fought not for ideals, but to return home. Their president was a realist too, more interested in achieving victory than preaching values. So soldiers and citizens alike lived immersed in the demands of war, backed by Washington's colossal marshalling of manpower, weapons, and ships for the fight overseas. What mattered was not morale but material, not appeals to hearts but supply lines to the front. The people's goodwill and soldiers' grim determination rested finally on national wealth and industrial might. America's optimism, pragmatism and impatience for results, shared by Roosevelt, pervaded the home front and foxholes alike. This practical focus, however, left little mark on the nation's vision for peace. Segregation continued, with blacks confined to support roles. The war's trauma and opportunities failed to spur social reforms. The greatest generation are aboard on, committed to winning but not to Roosevelt's loftier aspirations. The war was a present struggle disconnected from past or future, not a crusade for four freedoms. So Roosevelt guided a democracy united for battle, but uncertain of its purpose. He rallied Americans through realism more than soaring rhetoric. The war effort relied on U.S. economic power, not ideology, binding citizens and soldiers together through national interest more than ideals. America's consensus was for victory, not vision. War production and civilian sacrifice spoke louder than presidential eloquence. The people's pragmatic spirit matched Roosevelt's, get the war over with, then get on with life. The D-Day invasion faced numerous setbacks, scattered paratroopers, shot down gliders, fierce German resistance at Omaha Beach, yet ultimately succeeded due to extensive Allied preparation and strategy overpowering tactics. By day's end, endless ships and supplies had ensured victory. The Germans were overwhelmed, deceived about the landing site, and caught off guard with key commanders like Rummel away. The British and Canadians advanced inland while the Americans cut off the Cotentin Peninsula and captured Cherbo Port, after a devastating battle. Progress was slow through the thick Normandy hedgerows, but over a million men landed within weeks. A huge storm disrupted the supply line, but the artificial Mulberry harbors helped maintain the flow of men and material. Churchill visited the beaches, wishing Roosevelt could see the immense scale of operations, potentially a million aside. But Roosevelt could only view events from afar and tackle strategic decisions, like rejecting British appeals to divert forces from the planned southern France invasion, Operation Anvil, to instead boost Italy. Roosevelt prioritized direct Germany invasion over Mediterranean diversions for political and military reasons 
despite Churchill's protests. Ultimately, Anvil succeeded, validating the Americans' German affairs strategy. Politically, Roosevelt continued clashing with de Gaulle and his French Committee of National Liberation over control of liberated France. De Gaulle continually expanded his influence, sidelining Roosevelt's preferred leader Giraud, angering Roosevelt with his demands and rigidity. Roosevelt refused to empower what he saw as an illegitimate committee not fully representing French popular will. But practically he accepted de Gaulle's growing strength. When Eisenhower suggested only two French factions existed, Ritchie and Gaullist, Roosevelt insisted on self-determination for the French people, not external empowerment of any one faction, however tempting politically. He believed most ordinary citizens were still uninformed that the goal's popularity was ephemeral, but that the Allies must allow the French to choose their own post-war leadership, not have it dictated by outside powers. Still the Allies moved towards France's liberation amidst tension between American strategic leadership and French aspirations for political independence. In the spring of 1944, as American forces are gaining momentum in the Pacific, Admiral Chester Nimitz commands the Central Pacific Fleet, while General Douglas MacArthur leads Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific. Both aim to push the Japanese back, but they clash over strategy and priorities. Nimitz advocates a direct thrust across the Pacific, using island hopping to establish air bases all the way to Japan. MacArthur though is hell-bent on liberating the Philippines as he had promised those people years before. For months Roosevelt refuses to intervene, letting his subordinates compete for resources and glory. The immediate prize is the Mariana Islands, which would make superb air bases to bomb Tokyo. Nimitz dispatches a mammoth invasion force to take Saipan in June, prompting a massive Japanese naval response. Their planes swarm in droves, right into the teeth of Nimitz carriers and battleships. It's a turkey shoot, the outmatched Japanese planes fall by the hundreds while the American ships are barely scratched. On Saipan, the Marines face a bloody slog against determined Japanese defenders. Banzai charges come perilously close to breaching American lines before the Marines ultimately prevail. With the island secure, B-29 bombing raids on Japan can commence soon after. The Marianas victory bolsters Nimitz's direct approach, but MacArthur will not be deterred from his Philippine ambitions. He demands a meeting with Roosevelt to make his case in person. Awkwardly, he shows up late and empty-handed to the summit in Hawaii. But MacArthur turns on his persuasive charm with Roosevelt, arguing that America owes the Filipinos a debt of honor. Roosevelt acknowledges the moral argument and acquiesces to MacArthur's pleas. The Philippines will not be bypassed after all. For now, the two titans of Pacific strategy have aligned in uneasy compromise at the president's behest. Before departing, Roosevelt tours Oahu with Nimitz and MacArthur, greeting adoring crowds. He visits wounded soldiers at the hospital, intent on inspiring them with his own disability. The trip recharges his spirits even as he receives somber news from afar. Rodging ever northward to the frigid Aleutians, the president extols Alaska's future potential despite the miserable climate. After reviewing new advanced bases, he tells skeptical servicemen that thousands would eagerly trade places with them. His irrepressible optimism in the face of bleak conditions never falters. To observe fleet maneuvers, brighten a wounded soldier's face, feel cruiser engines pound beneath him, Roosevelt relished being commander-in-chief in the Pacific. He invited no military advisors to Honolulu, desiring to engage his theater commanders. Though tested soon as executive and politician, he preferred the military role. He cherished the title, whole recorded. At a cabinet dinner, Roosevelt asked to be addressed as commander-in-chief, not president. An Admiral King later wrote the weeks before, Li Yi had asked him to cease using commander-in-chief for both whole fleets, so there would be but one. Was it an order? King asked. No, Li Yi said, but the president desired it. King concluded Roosevelt wanted to play up the role in an election year. But it was more, Roosevelt assumed and embodied the role. As he told reporters of his journalistic days, farmers of his tree growing, or businessmen of his finances, he would be a soldier among soldiers. Partly because the role was crucial for a nation at war, and because he felt deprived at not seeing World War I service. He wanted to be a soldier, a professional. 
So he had a close rapport with his military chieftains, volunteering they'd had no basic differences. This was true only narrowly, the Joint Chiefs may not have presented a plan flatly vetoed. But Roosevelt had overridden military advice before, and preempted showdowns because the Chiefs knew his views. In real disputes between them, he maneuvered rather than permitted showdowns. Even on issues for political reasons, he rarely overruled military. One was commissioning Fiorello LaGuardia, whom Roosevelt cabled Eisenhower to appoint. But Stinson and Marshall intervened, persuading the president not to make LaGuardia a general. Stinson reported his firm advice to LaGuardia when they met that he must choose between soldier and propagandist and stay mayor using his influence. Roosevelt replied it was all wrong. He knew hundreds of Politico officers who were neither soldiers nor propagandists. And he disliked Stinson imputing false motives to LaGuardia and denying his war service hopes. Stinson answered politely but stood firm. Roosevelt mildly spoke up for LaGuardia with Stinson later but never commissioned him. Nor did Roosevelt intervene on some publicly controversial military matters. And despite chances for political pressure, his general selection record was uniquely scrupulous. Still, as commander-in-chief he readily proposed ideas and changes to the military. He authorized the Navy to take Atlantic convoy risks due to African emergency needs. He queried details and gave instructions on rotating personnel. In advising the Navy thus, he seemed to act more as team leader than civilian outsider. Nor did he overturn many court martials, though the exceptions are notable. Vastly amused by a young lieutenant merely allowing a sergeant to shoot a limping calf, he put the man on probation. This man must be taught not to shoot calves. He also gave probation to a nurse who went able to have a delayed honeymoon with her sailor husband. From the start Roosevelt shielded his commander role. Appointing Leahy, he made clear the admiral would be an aide, advisor and summarizer, whatever necessary, from the point of view of the commander-in-chief. Reporters didn't quite understand, would Leahy be chief of staff to a UN command? To the commander-in-chief, Roosevelt insisted. His job description was so predictive that years later Leahy used it to describe his White House work. Perhaps this was unsurprising, for Roosevelt's whole command structure was remarkably stable. The men starting out with him, Stinson, Marshall, King, Arnold, Leahy, were still there at the end. Only Knox and Stark were missing, the first by death, the second over Pearl Harbor. Even substituting Eisenhower for Marshall was too disruptive for Roosevelt. So how did Roosevelt withdraw when strategy demanded? The paradox of civil-military relations, as William Emerson pointed out, is that political leadership must shape military forces to its purposes, though responsive to technical advice on deploying them. The Constitution gave the President supreme command, events had expanded his powers and responsibilities. He could delegate some powers but not the responsibility. Roosevelt handled the paradox by splitting his military role from his political. As Commander-in-Chief, he left planning to the Joint Chiefs and planners. His differences with them over military policy arose from differing military views, not in pursuing political objectives. Before Pearl Harbor, he focused more on harnessing Anglo-American power against Hitler, while they wanted to build up under-equipped forces. As the war progressed, thinking converged because of rapport, build-up, and the global scope of operations. Roosevelt still pressed his military men, but more as a team leader than civilian executive. When politics intruded on military matters, he deferred to his chief's judgment. Yet Roosevelt never fully ceded control of global strategy to the military, as some presidents have done. He sanctioned military autonomy in operations and planning, while reserving strategic oversight himself. This balancing act maintained good relations with his chiefs, protected his political leadership, and mobilized the nation. The Joint Chiefs accepted the arrangement, recognizing the President's constitutional responsibilities and his skillful balancing. They handled operations, he handled politics and higher strategy. Disputes were resolved through discussion, not confrontation. Each side respected the other's realm and expertise. Of course Roosevelt's military subordinates could only go so far before politics constrained them. And the President's strategic ideas arose partly from political calculation. But the two realms were delineated enough for a working relationship. 
The president was no passive rubber stamper of military schemes, nor did he ignore political constraints on them. But he avoided imposing political objectives or overriding on operational grounds. This creative balancing act maintained civilian control while mobilizing military expertise, the essence of civil military relations in a democracy. The commander in chief led, but mostly by consent, the chiefs followed, but with wide autonomy. In Roosevelt, they found a president willing to delegate, but not abdicate, who respected their military realm while safeguarding his own. However paradoxical, the arrangement worked. It was 1944, an election year in the midst of World War II. The Republican Party was hoping to unseat President Roosevelt and the Democrats who had been in power for 12 years. Several Republican candidates emerged, seeking the nomination. The most active was Wendell Wilkie, the party's 1940 nominee. However, Wilkie had alienated the Republican establishment. His only hope was to demonstrate his popularity by winning several primary elections. But he failed badly, not winning a single delegate in the Wisconsin primary. Devastated, Wilkie quit the race. With Wilkie out, General Douglas MacArthur emerged as a potential candidate favored by conservative Republicans. But MacArthur said any high military officer at the front should not be considered for president. That left just one candidate still standing, Thomas E. Dewey, the 42-year-old governor of New York. Dewey had unsuccessfully sought the nomination in 1940. This time, he smoothly locked up the delegates and won the nomination on the first ballot. In his acceptance speech, Dewey lambasted the Democrats for growing tired and quarrelsome after 12 years in power. On the Democratic side, there was little doubt President Roosevelt would run again, though he claimed he wanted to retire. The big question was his running mate, as the next vice president would be in a strong position for 1948. FDR encouraged various candidates to run while never clearly backing anyone. He seemed to undermine Henry Wallace, his current VP. With the convention nearing, Roosevelt hosted a meeting of party bosses in the White House to discuss options. One by one, they eliminated candidates like Wallace and James Burns. The talk turned to Harry Truman, whom FDR appreciated for his loyalty. Despite some concerns about Truman's age, Roosevelt gave his blessing. And with that, the backroom dealing was done, and the stage was set for the 1944 election. So as the country pressed on with World War II, two familiar figures from the 1940 election, Roosevelt and Dewey, faced off again for years later. But each had a new running mate, Truman for the Democrats and John Bricker for the Republicans. Dewey attacked the Democrats as old, tired and quarrelsome. Roosevelt meanwhile continued to keep Americans guessing if he would really serve another full term or let his new vice president take over. The stage was set for a hard-fought election even with the nation still at war. The year was 1944 and FDR was running for an unprecedented fourth term as president. Now FDR's health was failing him, though he tried his best to hide it. There were rumors swirling about operations and hospitalizations, and his opponents were saying he was too sick to lead. But FDR kept on campaigning, taking a long trip to California, Hawaii, and Alaska to show his strength. However, the strain was getting to him. Once, while chatting with his son James, FDR suddenly convulsed in pain, his face white and drawn. For minutes he could not go on, but he refused to cancel his next event. His doctor, Bruin, did not even realize the severity of this episode. FDR wanted to show he still had vigor, so he decided to give a big campaign speech at a baseball stadium in Seattle on his way back east. But his advisors convinced him it would be better, for security reasons, to speak from the deck of his destroyer, with the guns as a backdrop. So FDR gave his speech on the ship, against the wind. He was uncomfortable, without his leg braces properly fitted. And as he started speaking, he suffered his first and only heart attack. For 15 agonizing minutes his chest tightened and pain radiated through him. But he persevered and finished the speech, though it rambled and his delivery was halting. His doctor and advisors had no idea what had just happened. Clearly, FDR no longer had his old campaign magic. He left much of the political planning to others while he focused on being president, signing popular legislation for veterans, proposing exciting post-war development projects, upholding civil rights.
But FDR had one more remarkable political manoeuvre in him, though its true intention remains unclear. He reached out to Wendell Wilkie, his former Republican opponent for president. Wilkie and FDR were both frustrated with the Conservatives in their parties, and they were the two most revered political figures in the country at the time. So FDR proposed that after the election, they joined forces to realign American politics around a new Liberal Party, leaving Conservative Southern Democrats and Republicans together in an opposing party. Wilkie was enthusiastic about the idea when they secretly met in New York, but they failed to follow through. Perhaps FDR was not fully committed and saw it as an election ploy. Or perhaps their ideological zeal made cooperation difficult, even for these two political giants who dreamed of consolidating the liberal cause in America. In 1944, even as the war raged on, Roosevelt was focused on America's role in maintaining peace and security after an Allied victory. He was pursuing his idea that nations must learn to work together by actually working together on issues like food, refugees, and health. This bridge building took place through organizations like UNRI for relief efforts. But the toughest challenge was collaboration between the major powers, the US, Britain, and the Soviet Union, to keep the peace after the war. Planning was underway in mid-1944 for a United Nations conference. Roosevelt had to propitiate members of Congress worried about American sovereignty. The British feared dollar dominance but needed American financing. Negotiations over exact plans and structures were complex. A conference finally took place in July in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Delegates agreed to create a stabilization fund to support exchange rates and a World Bank for reconstruction assistance. But the political challenges remained. The Soviet Union was determined to have veto power over major UN decisions, arguing this was needed to prevent aggression against smaller nations. The US opposed this as allowing the major powers to escape accountability. Roosevelt tried to persuade the Soviets to accept limitations on the veto power in one-on-one -on -one talks. But in the end, Stalin refused to compromise. The UN conference ended with no resolution on restraining the great powers and keeping the peace. In September, Churchill and Roosevelt met again in Quebec, now as victors eyeing the end of the war in Europe. They debated old issues like Mediterranean strategy in a more relaxed way with success in sight. But controversy remained over the UN veto issue and Soviet demands for 16 votes for its republics. As US and Soviet troops approached victory, no agreement had been reached on keeping the great powers in check when peace came. Roosevelt still believed that the personal relationships between leaders could resolve these issues. But others saw national interests, not trust, as determining international affairs. The books and articles in 1944 reflected these divisions. Some intellectuals argued idealistically for a new League of Nations, while realists said lasting peace would only come slowly. FDR feared these debates would hurt the UN domestically. He asked for more grassroots efforts to educate the public. Roosevelt walked a fine line politically on the UN. He let whole river Republican claims that the Big Four would dominate the new organization. But he resisted compromises on the veto power that could antagonize the isolationist Senate. Above all, he still pinned hopes on persuading Stalin through friendly personal diplomacy. The 1944 election and the end of the war thus approached without resolution on the UN's ability to keep a sustained peace. Despite the camaraderie of victory, deep divisions endured between national visions of the post-war order. Roosevelt's supreme political skill would be tested in finding a workable unity amidst this discord. In September 1944, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was running for an unprecedented fourth term as doubts swirled about his health. At a dinner with Democratic supporters, his daughter Anna worried whether her father still had his old campaign magic. Roosevelt soon dispelled those doubts. Despite remaining seated, he delivered a fiery speech lambasting Republicans and outlining his progressive vision. His sharp wit, sarcasm, and animated delivery drew waves of laughter and applause. The speech electrified reporters and forced Dewey to campaign more aggressively. After lying low for a month, Roosevelt next confronted doubts about his stamina. He toured New York City for hours in an open car despite pouring rain. 
Over two million people lined the routes, seeing Roosevelt's beaming smile and upraised arm. That evening he gave a major speech staking out a firm stance for the UN Security Council to have forced to keep the peace, outflanking Dewey. Joe Ball, a Dewey ally, endorsed Roosevelt's position. A week later in Philadelphia, Roosevelt again toured for hours in the rain. He spoke of his efforts before Pearl Harbor to strengthen the military against Republican obstruction and his wartime leadership. He promised servicemen would be promptly returned after the war. His vigor in the stormy open car motorcade answered skepticism about his health. Behind the scenes, Roosevelt faced low democratic turnout as the biggest threat. His aide Louis Bean found participation was of crucial importance. With many traditional Democrats unable to vote, Roosevelt turned to Sidney Hillman's CIO Political Action Committee, or PAC. The PAC had organization, talent and energy to turn out voters. But it also brought charges Roosevelt was captive to labor radicals. As election day neared, Roosevelt concentrated on the big cities. He returned to New York for a massive rally at Ebbets Field. A huge crowd roared as Roosevelt excoriated Dewey and the Republican Congress, hailed the New Deal, and proclaimed the Democratic Party the true party of the common man. After red-baiting assaults, Roosevelt climactically declared he welcomed the support of all Americans, regardless of faith or ancestry or economic status. Roosevelt climaxed his campaign with a whirlwind final week. He traveled over 11,000 miles through eight states, giving major speeches in Chicago, Boston, and Buffalo, among others. A quarter million turned out in Chicago's Soldier Field for Roosevelt's slashing attack on the Republican reactionaries. In Boston, he called isolationists the American firsters who put private profit ahead of national interest. Always he hammered the theme that the Republican Congress, not Dewey, would hold power. On election eve, Roosevelt returned to Hyde Park. He had campaigned on the pledge that the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Tens of millions of voters the next day showed they still had faith in Franklin D. Roosevelt. As the campaign entered its final days, Dewey escalated his red-baiting attacks. He railed Roosevelt had put the Democratic Party on the auction block to communists and labor radicals. His aide Rosenman warned these smears were resonating with voters who feared communism more than fascism. Roosevelt initially resisted answering the charges with unvarnished contempt for Dewey. But Democratic leaders warned the attacks were working. Roosevelt confronted the red-baiting head-on before huge crowds in Boston and New York. In Boston, he steered Dewey for claiming in one speech communists were taking over the New Deal and in another that Roosevelt's fourth-term bid threatened monarchy. Which is it, communism or monarchy? Roosevelt thundered. We want neither. He vowed to continue living under the Constitution for another 150 years. In New York's Abbott's Field, Roosevelt climactically declared he welcomed the support of all Americans regardless of background. His voice rising, he challenged, when any politician says solemnly the government could be sold out to communists, then I say that candidate reveals a shocking lack of trust in America. Roosevelt closed by reminding the Irish of Al Smith's lesson against bigotry. He proclaimed the Murphys and Kellys were fighting for freedom alongside the Cabots and Lowells. The crowd roared its approval. On election eve, Roosevelt gave a radio address ending in a prayer for continued leadership. At Hyde Park, he voted with difficulty, swearing as he struggled with the machine. Then began the ritual, tally sheets on the dining table, friends and staff gathered around the radio. Once again the big states fell in line. Not until 3 a.m. did Dewey finally concede. Roosevelt turned to an aide, I still think he is a son of a bitch. In a Pittsburgh letter, a black woman wrote she had always believed God put Roosevelt in office for the poor person. She was praying for his re-election for as long as you live, for you are the man for us. Millions of forgotten Americans had placed their trust in Roosevelt. He had given them hope during depression and war. Now they were repaying that trust, sweeping aside Dewey's attacks to give their champion for more years. As World War II raged on in Europe, political tension simmered, threatening the unity of the Allies. Though American President Franklin Roosevelt wanted to postpone political disputes until after the war, the future of Poland became a heated issue. 
Stalin urged the Polish resistance in Warsaw to unite with the Soviet-backed Lublin Poles, but they refused. When the Warsaw resistance rose up against the Germans and pleaded for Allied help, Stalin shockingly accused them of recklessness and left them to die at German hands. Over 200,000 were killed as Warsaw was destroyed. Roosevelt was distressed but feared jeopardizing military cooperation with Russia by pressing the issue. The Polish leader Mikolajczyk desperately appealed to Roosevelt to intervene over Soviet demands to annex half of Poland, but Roosevelt evasively refused, further disheartening the London-based Polish government in exile. Against Roosevelt's protests, Stalin soon recognized the Lublin Poles as Poland's legitimate government. While Churchill tried realpolitik bargaining with Stalin over spheres of influence in Eastern Europe, Roosevelt resisted such cynical horse trading over Poland's fate. But Roosevelt also refused Churchill's urging to take a harder line with Stalin over Warsaw. A bitter dispute also broke out between them over Italy, where Churchill intervened against the appointment of a leftist politician without consulting Roosevelt. As Soviet troops stood by, communist rebel forces vied for control of Greece. Determined to prevent a communist takeover there, Churchill sent in British troops, enraging liberals in America. Roosevelt refused to back this heavy-handed intervention. For Churchill, only more Allied troops could shape the new Europe and keep communism at bay. But the dying Roosevelt retained hopes of partnership with Stalin in the new United Nations organization. The tragic destruction of Warsaw presaged the Cold War divide soon to dominate Europe. Roosevelt and Churchill were deeply divided over how to handle an obstinate Stalin and manage the seismic political forces unleashed by the war. Despite past unity against fascism, hopes for continued cooperation dimmed the Soviet power and ambition to control Eastern Europe became undeniable. Two very different visions of the post-war world were emerging, one of spheres of influence carved up by mighty armies, the other of independent nations freely determining their own fates under international law. The seeds of future conflict were being sown. In the Far East, Roosevelt faced a sharp contrast between brilliant advances in the Pacific and stalemate on the Asian landmass. The Philippines shielded vital lifelines across the South China Sea to target Formosa, China's coast, and Japan itself. As MacArthur's forces landed on Leta, Japanese naval forces moved to counterattack from Singapore and Japan. Defending Leta were Admiral Kincaid's 7th Fleet under MacArthur and Admiral Hall's 3rd Fleet under Nimitz. On October 23rd, Japan unleashed its counter-offensive. Vice Admiral Kyoto advanced towards San Bernardino Strait but suffered heavy attacks, forcing withdrawal. To the south, Vice Admiral Nishimura met devastating ambushes in Surigao Strait. A third Japanese fleet aimed not to fight, but to lure away Hall's 3rd Fleet, leaving the landings exposed. Eager for battle, Halsey took the bait. In the epic clash that followed, neither side grasped the other's moves amid confusion and valor. Battered Kyoto again turned toward the vulnerable transports, pounding the lightly armed carriers defending them. On the brink of victory, he mysteriously retreated, enabling Halsey's return. But Halsey had steamed hundreds of miles without engaging the main forces. Despite brilliant seamanship and technology, communications failures and divided commands haunted the Allies. In China and Burma, infantry and air power were still decisive. In early 1944, Japan struck India and China, aiming to divide them politically. In Burma, Japan sought to outflank the British advance, but was itself outflanked and repulsed. Approaches to India were secured. Stillwell captured Mitkiana airfield, protecting supply routes into China. But Japan scored heavily in China, threatening air bases and communications. Ambassador Gauss warned of collapsing resistance and peasant turnabouts. Arriving in June, Stillwell reinforced Chenault while fearing little could stop Japan's advance. China's mounting resistance fulfilled Roosevelt's fears. Despite skepticism, he had championed China, exhorting Chen while avoiding confrontation. But now his strategy crumbled. Drastic measures must be taken, Roosevelt warned Chiang, demanding Stilwell receive unrestricted command of China's forces. Chiang acquiesced in principle, but requested a delay, citing complex internal factors. He asked Roosevelt to send an envoy. Roosevelt dispatched General Hurley to mediate. 
In September, Stilwell warned the jig is up in South China. Yet hope lingered in the north. Visiting Yan'an on Roosevelt's urging, Americans met cordial, disciplined communists under Mao. Amid order and purpose, Mao optimistically queried them on Roosevelt's re-election prospects, intent on waiting out the cure minting. Roosevelt hardened toward Chiang in a stinging cable, demanding he resist looming disaster by finally empowering Stilwell over all China's armies. Stilwell gleefully presented this harpoon to Chiang. But Chiang counterattacked, demanding Stilwell's total removal for inability to cooperate. Marshall urged Roosevelt to stand firm behind Stilwell and China's reformists. But Roosevelt relented, agreeing to remove Stilwell from all commands. No American would lead China's forces now. No basic reorganization or unification with communists would occur either. By November, Roosevelt's China strategy lay in ruins. Roosevelt was a complex leader who harbored both lofty ideals and hard-headed pragmatism when it came to prosecuting the war. On one hand, he spoke eloquently of securing the four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, freedom from want, not just for America, but the whole world. He envisioned a post-war order where former enemies became partners through bodies like the United Nations. Yet Roosevelt made many decisions during the war that seemed to compromise those high ideals for temporary military gains. Nowhere was this more apparent than in China. Early on, Roosevelt aimed to strengthen China's military capability and eventual emergence as a great power. But as Japan gained ground and China's internal weaknesses were exposed, Roosevelt essentially abandoned China as a key military ally. Rather than coerce reforms from Chiang Kai-shek, Roosevelt minimized friction with what he knew was a corrupt, incompetent regime. He repeatedly deferred to Chiang's demands and vanity at the expense of the exceptionally capable Stilwell. Roosevelt wanted to uphold China's prestige, despite shifting military priorities to Europe and the Pacific Islands. This split between strategic visions and military realities proved unsustainable. In Europe too, Roosevelt focused ruthlessly on the invasion of France, overruling British calls for more peripheral operations in the Mediterranean. Roosevelt wanted the most direct attack on Germany possible to end the war quickest. He was willing to delay helping Jewish refugees and addressing obvious post-war issues around Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. Above all, victory through unity of purpose mattered most. This single-minded military focus culminated in Roosevelt's demand for Germany's unconditional surrender, insisting over his own chief's advice. It likely hardened Nazi resistance, costing more lives. But it also ensured total Allied commitment to victory. As Roosevelt said, for him political considerations were secondary to military operations striking at the German heartland. So, while Roosevelt harbored grand visions, when choices appeared between political sensitivities and raw military power, he usually chose power. The man who dreamed of building a just, peaceful world order via the Four Freedoms made hard compromises along the way seeking to destroy those threatening that order first. His flaw was in separating means and ends, rather than aligning them. Roosevelt's attitude reflected America's still naive idealism coupled with its newfound power. But power without wisdom corrupts noble aims. Perhaps Roosevelt's failing health in his final years also explained his reluctance to wrestle more with reconciling his high principles and gritty policy. Nonetheless, Roosevelt still deserves credit for establishing a values-based global vision that much of the post-war order fulfilled. If he had not relentlessly focused on military victory, such visions would have remained empty dreams. His grand strategy was imperfect in execution, but captured an essential moral clarity. Freedom must be fought for and actively built, not passively hoped for. Roosevelt's legacy was setting American power and ideals in common cause, even if the relationship often strained him. The holiday season of 1944 brought both hope and hardship. As Roosevelt celebrated Christmas at Hyde Park, he kept one eye on the family festivities and another on reports from the Battle of the Bulge raging in Europe. Just weeks before, Roosevelt had won re-election to an unprecedented fourth term, promising to win the war abroad and extend progressive policies at home. Yet Roosevelt returned to find much unfinished business, both globally and domestically. His Secretary of State Hull, worn down after 11 years of service, resigned despite Roosevelt's pleas to stay. 
Roosevelt tapped Undersecretary Stettinius as replacement, but this young bureaucrat inspired little confidence in handling the immense challenges ahead. Moreover, several of Roosevelt's new appointments raised concerns he was abandoning New Deal ideals. When pressed by reporters about going right, Roosevelt insisted he would hold a steady, moderately liberal course. But his new team seemed anything but. The disconnect between Roosevelt's words and actions would only grow. Even graver news came from the European Front. Despite mounting losses, Hitler unleashed a massive counterattack through the Ardennes forest, seeking to divide the Allied armies. The bold gambit initially paid off as German forces drove a dangerous bulge in the Allied lines, surrounding key locations like Bastogne. The situation looked dire. Roosevelt and his generals followed intently on maps in the White House, hoping the lines would hold. As a summer Roosevelt read a Christmas carol to his grandchildren at Hyde Park, he doubtless connected with Scrooge's glimpse of a dark, ominous future. The president took brief solace in his family's warmth, but he understood global threats darkening the coming year. Within days, the bolts would be halted as dogged American troops held out for Patton's army to relieve them. But the German onslaught foreshadowed that final victory would require more Allied blood and resolve. So at Christmas 1944, Roosevelt stood between the past and future, between his old New Deal spirit now waning and his new global role still unfolding. He hoped to win the war without abandoning liberal progressivism, even as political compromises mounted. He aspired to build a just post-war order through bodies like the United Nations, even as temporary alliances with dubious characters like Stalin already strained such ideals. With hopes high but unity fraying both at home and abroad, Roosevelt embodied America's wider attempt to reconcile its founding democratic vision with its new power. In this, the president displayed both bold ambition and sober wisdom about difficulties ahead. His Christmas prayer was that, through unity and sacrifice, Americans could close the gap between their shining ideals and harsh realities, securing victory abroad while advancing justice at home. The road ahead would test these hopes mightily. But Roosevelt understood history's long arc bent toward justice only through commitment and courage across generations. A long trial awaited, but it would determine whether America's example would light the way or fade like a dying ember. The people themselves must choose. As President Roosevelt returned to the White House in January 1945, he faced major decisions on the path to ending the war and securing the peace. Public opinion polls showed declining confidence in Roosevelt's handling of foreign affairs and a lack of knowledge about Britain's war effort, while most Americans favored a strong international organization their views lacked a long-range conception and were prone to fickleness. At his first cabinet meeting of the year, Roosevelt heard reports on the bulge battle, Poland, shipping problems, and more. Ike joked that he should be made king of Polynesia. Roosevelt asked Congress for a national service law to fully mobilize manpower and use the services of four F men. His budget proposed continued high spending, reflecting an expectation of a long war against Japan, in his lengthy State of the Union address, Roosevelt defended his Europe First strategy, praised the Italian campaign, warned against enemy propaganda, and called for a strong UN and new social programs. He rejected most cabinet resignations but accepted Jesse Jones's, replacing him with Henry Wallace. Francis Perkins tried to resign, but Roosevelt refused, saying, You can't go now. I can't think of anybody else. Rumors spread of divisions within the administration, but they were exaggerated. Roosevelt had to deal with petty disputes like one between Ike's and Lillian Ford. On Inauguration Day, Roosevelt took the oath of office in a simple ceremony on the White House portico to save money. In his speech, he spoke of passing through a period of supreme test and striving for perfection. He said we have learned that we cannot live alone, at peace, that our own well-being is dependent on the well-being of other nations and he said lasting peace could only be gained with the understanding and the confidence and the courage which flow from conviction. In summary, as 1945 began, Roosevelt faced major decisions on the war and peace. Public opinion lacked a long-range view of internationalism. Roosevelt asked Congress for expanded war powers but budgeted for a long war against Japan. His State of the Union address covered his four domestic and foreign agenda. 
though there were rumors of divisions within his administration, Roosevelt dealt with typical management challenges. His simple inauguration day speech reflected his vision of America's role in the world and the path to lasting peace through understanding, confidence and conviction. It was February 1945, the tides of war were turning against Germany, and the leaders of the great Allied powers met in the resort city of Yalta on the Black Sea. President Franklin Roosevelt, revered yet secretly ailing, who made the long journey for this last roll of the dice. He aimed to build a lasting peace, bracing his hopes in the new United Nations he dreamed would rise from the ashes of war. There was the irascible, eloquent Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain, desperately working to secure her fading imperial glory. And there was Marshal Stalin, the Soviet despot hosting them in his homeland, whose inscrutable gaze concealed designs on an empire of his own. Gathered in the faded opulence of the Charles Palace, an unmighty trio, the patrician, the parliamentarian, and the revolutionary, but they shared a bond forged by the fires of a terrible war against a common foe. Roosevelt's goal at Yalta was to charm Stalin, to disarm him with camaraderie and goodwill, or to realize his vision of post-war harmony. Across candlelit dinners, vodka toasts, and flattering small talk, Roosevelt played the gracious host to his wary guest. But on matters of power and principle, Stalin would not yield. The leader sparred over voting rights in the new UN, Stalin demanded veto power to block proceedings, a crude concession to might over moral authority. Roosevelt pushed back, seeking compromise, but eventually relented to preserve unity. The biggest bone of contention remained Poland. Stalin was determined to extend Soviet domination, while the Allies sought self-determination. As with the UN, Roosevelt gambled that flexibility and friendly persuasion would mollify Stalin's aggression. By conference's end, champagne flowed as the Big Three proclaimed a new era of partnership. Only Churchill harbored darker forebodings as Stalin raised his final toast. I want to drink to our alliance. Our allies should not deceive each other. Perhaps that is naive? No, it is best not to deceive even if he is a fool. Was Stalin paying lip service to lofty ideals? Or revealing his authentic desire for trust with the West? Roosevelt left Yalta heartened, but weaker and close to the end of his days. The future would reveal the true intentions behind Stalin's words. So ended this fateful summit, where three giants battled for the soul of the post-war world. Their human designs and follies would shape geopolitics for generations to come. It remains a riveting drama of power and personality in a time of titans. Now Roosevelt, he seemed quite frail and sickly in Yalta. His face thin as a ghost, his friends feared he was a dying man. But the president kept on going through sheer grit. He handled the negotiations just fine even as his strength faded day by day. When Stalin raised the issue of the Soviet Union joining the fight against Japan, Roosevelt remembered past talks on the matter. Stalin wanted some things in return, the Kiowau Islands, Lower Sakhalin, Port Arthur, control over railways in Manchuria. Roosevelt knew he and his military needed the Soviet army against Japan, so they wanted Stalin in the war. But old Roosevelt, he wanted something from Stalin too, for Stalin to support China led by Chiang Kai-shek after the war. Quite a dilemma. Now Stalin, he knew the timing of his declaration of war on Japan would give him leverage. Roosevelt's army general said the Russians had to attack before the US invasion of Japan's home islands. Stalin figured he could wait and join in later when it suited him more. The two leaders, they understood power and self-interest real well, you see. With clever old Joe Stalin, you had to make concessions to gain his cooperation. Roosevelt played his cards, offering up territories and railway rights Stalin wanted. But Roosevelt, he got Stalin to promise in secret to respect China's sovereignty after the war and make Port Arthur a free port. They kept it all hush-hush so Japan wouldn't catch wind and attack the Soviet Union first. Churchill didn't love the backroom deals that went along since Britain couldn't get Stalin's support alone. And the ailing Roosevelt, he left Yalta still hoping to gain more support from Stalin and other world leaders for China after he charmed the kings of Egypt and Saudi Arabia. But Roosevelt would pass on before the war's end, leaving the promises and horse trading of Yalta for his successor President Truman to judge. 
quite a diplomatic drama between the ailing democratic leader from the West and the Iron World Communist dictator from the East. The best laid plans of great men and superpowers, all trying to come out on top in remaking the post-war world order. Now, Roosevelt, he was a sickly man nearing his final days, yet still working tirelessly to build peace. And Stalin, well, he was as hard and cold as the Russian winter. These two men met with Churchill at Yalta and came to an accord on the fate of Poland after the war. But no sooner had they returned home did it all unravel. Stalin installed a communist puppet regime in Warsaw contrary to their plans. Churchill and Roosevelt objected fiercely for the Polish people deserved freedom after such suffering under the Nazi heel. Yet Stalin would not budge one inch. Roosevelt's health failing, Churchill took up the mantle, cabling the president urging a united front against Stalin's betrayal. Still Roosevelt delayed, hoping to keep their grand alliance together. Then came a ray of hope, secret talks of Germany's surrender in Italy that could hasten victory. But cursed suspicion filled Stalin's dark heart. He accused the Allies of cutting a deal with the enemy unknown to him. Roosevelt pleaded innocence, but Stalin smelled plots and schemes. The alliance was crumbling, the end of their friendship nigh. With victory so close at hand, how could it have come to this? The seed sown at Yalta had borne bitter fruit. Neither fully trusted the other, Roosevelt too idealistic, Stalin too cynical. Poland lay trapped between western dreams and eastern armies. And as Roosevelt's strength ebbed, so too did hopes of peace. In February 1945, the Allied forces were making important advances against Japan, capturing islands that brought them closer to the Japanese mainland. On the island of Iwo Jima, the fighting was intense as US Marines tried to take control from over 20,000 deeply entrenched Japanese defenders. Both sides suffered enormous losses, with most of the Japanese forces dying in the battle. The US demonstrated its naval power by bombing Tokyo and landing forces just 350 miles from Japan's coast. Meanwhile in China, tensions were rising between the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao Zedong. Despite US Ambassador Patrick Hurley's efforts, the two sides failed to form a coalition government. With the war against Japan nearing its end, a civil war looked imminent. General Wiedemeyer warned that U.S. aid was driving the communists closer to Russia's orbit. In April, U.S. forces invaded Okinawa seeking to capture a key island on Japan's doorstep. The defending Japanese forces fought tenaciously, exacting heavy casualties through conventional and kamikaze attacks. The ferocity of the Japanese defense cast doubt on plans for a future U.S. invasion of mainland Japan. Military leaders grappled with estimates of massive casualties. Attention turned to the atomic bomb being developed in utmost secrecy. Scientists tried urgently to convince policymakers to share information on the bomb and place it under international control. But US leaders were divided on cooperation with the Soviet Union regarding the bomb. Neither Roosevelt nor Stinson wanted to decide anything until after the first test. Roosevelt remained focused on securing independence for Indochina from returning French colonial rule. He discussed trusteeships with Stalin and opposed Churchill's defense of preserving the British Empire. But Roosevelt avoided a direct confrontation with Churchill that might damage their alliance. Though sincere in his anti-colonial ideals, Roosevelt lacked a clear post-war strategy that accounted for global strategic relationships and the complex local politics of Southeast Asia. In the late winter and early spring of 1945, the Allied coalition was under mounting strain even as military victories brought the prospect of victory closer. Difficult debates loomed about the post-war order in Asia and the terrifying new atomic technology. Faithfully, President Roosevelt would not live to grapple with these challenges. As 1945 progressed, President Roosevelt focused intensely on laying the foundations for a lasting post-war peace, even as momentous military victories brought the war nearer to a close. But at home, Roosevelt struggled to move forward his ambitious liberal agenda through a resistant Congress. By spring, the tide was turning decisively against Germany on both eastern and western fronts. American troops encircled the vital Ruhr region and stood poised to advance on Berlin. Roosevelt could foresee Nazi defeat by summer's end. 
In the Pacific, Marines suffered horrific losses seizing Iwo Jima, while kamikaze attacks exacted a grim toll. Yet victory over Japan too appeared imminent. Amid these pivotal weeks, Roosevelt journeyed to Warm Springs seeking rest and revival. Upon his arrival, friends noted an alarming deterioration in his once vibrant appearance and manner. Roosevelt rallied briefly, buoyed by the verdant Georgia Spring and a string of Allied conquests. But his strength and stamina continued to steadily decline. Roosevelt focused on securing independence for the Philippines and checking European colonial ambitions across Southeast Asia. He hoped to travel to San Francisco to preside over the founding conference of the United Nations. And he looked forward to a delayed reunion with Churchill in England. But fate would decree otherwise. In mid-April, Roosevelt drafted a Jefferson Day radio address reaffirming his vision for a just post-war order. He called for conquering doubt and fear to build a world where all peoples could live and work in peace. With confidence and faith, Roosevelt insisted tomorrow's possibilities were limitless. It would be his last public message. The very next day, while sitting for a portrait, Roosevelt suddenly complained of acute head pain and collapsed. He was carried to bed unconscious. Roosevelt died a few hours later from a massive cerebral hemorrhage. He was just 63. Shock and grief reverberated around the nation and world. Solemn crowds gathered outside the White House. President Truman, flushed into leadership in an instant, pledged to continue Roosevelt's policies. As soldiers fell silent across battlefronts, even hardened generals wept. Winston Churchill spoke for many when he movingly eulogized his great ally and friend. In FDR, there died the greatest American friend we have ever known and the greatest champion of freedom who has ever brought help and comfort from the new world to the old.